At any rate, here we are for another round of uh, something. I, let me think about this. I think it's something about 12 dozen things in Colorado. <laughs> and we've already done mountains and rivers and national parks and we've done wildlife diversity. Last month was almost a marathon. You remember that one? Yeah. yeah. You stayed awake yeah. long enough to remember? So I'm trying to be discreet and, and it's a little bit more into the time interval this month. But we've already taken 10 minutes, so we'll probably slop over. Who knows? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. All righty. Somebody want to catch the light switch there? Here we are, 12 dozen things about Colorado. This is session 10 of 12, iconic natural landmarks. And before we go much farther, you know, I could just ask you to give me a list of landmarks and just kind of holler them out and what have you but it would be all over the board. So we're going to start out by kind of defining what I mean by iconic natural landmarks. First of all, landmarks, what are they? You know, it all depends on who you are and what your perspective is and the kind of lifestyle and culture you're, you're a part of as to what you consider to be landmarks. And a lot of them are man-made. I mean, there's Blucifer right there, you know? <laughs> And it could be all kinds of things, whether it's the tents at DIA or the chapel at the Air Force Academy or whatever it might be. There are people who would think of these kinds of things, like the Brown Palace in downtown Denver as being landmarks. So, landmark, by my definition, is something that in some manner uniquely associates with a time, an event, or a place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure it does. How about natural? What does it mean to be natural? Uh, that's not as tricky as one might think, but there is a little bit to it. To be natural implies occurring or existing within, without involvement of people. And so if you have a landmark like a, a hotel that's been around a long time, or a chapel, people built that. That's not natural. It might be a landmark, but it's not a natural landmark. You with me there? Yes. Okay, so then, what does it mean to be iconic? Well, in the original usage of the word icon, it was a device or an implement that was representative of a religious belief. But over the, the centuries that we've been using that word, and especially in the last century, we've, we've expanded the concept of iconic or icon to mean anything that has substantial meaning to it or something that defines a place, event, or something in a unique association. So now we put all three of these together, we have iconic natural landmarks. And so we're talking about things that occur in nature without human involvement and yet they have some kind of specific meaning that culture, society, and people understand. You with me? Yeah. I love it. So, thing one, an iconic natural landmark is a structure that exists through the forces of nature and is definitively identified with a specific place. How's that? Okay. There'll be a quiz. <laughs> so, what are the naturally occurring structures that define the character of Colorado? What comes to mind? Mountains. Mountains. Any mountains in particular, more so than others? Pikes Peak, 14ers, Snowy Range. Snowy Range. I thought that was in Australia. No, that, that's Snowy River, never mind. Long's Peak, what? Royal Gorge. Royal Gorge, yeah. Mm hmm. All of a sudden, you see how this stacks up to being a three and a half hour program? <laughs> so, let's go find some of these landmarks, shall we? Okay. Some landmarks only have local recognition. So, it all depends on where you live, and there are people who understand certain kinds of landmarks around them. Like here in northern Colorado, obviously, Horsetooth Rock, right? Yes. But if you're down in Cortez or you're in Minneapolis, would Horsetooth Rock be something that would be a, a big deal? 
Not, probably not. And then we have the Noku Crags. And if you're from around here, that's a big deal. People understand it, and it's quite often very photogenic. But the point is, some landmarks only have local recognition. But some landmarks have a larger, more regional recognition, like Rabbit Ears Pass, named after Rabbit Ears Peak. That's a little blurry, isn't it? Well, just squint. <laughs> that, that'll help out. Anybody know what happened here two years ago? Yeah, part of the ear uh, up there fell off back in 2017. And then we have a place like the Flatirons, and it is so connected to the town of Boulder, the city of Boulder, that the two are almost synonyms. Yeah. You, know? you have any idea what a flat iron is? It's an iron. It's an iron. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> and it's flat. <laughs> you know, I thought we were going to get along today. <laughs> Back in the old days when people did laundry and they ironed their fabrics, you would heat the iron on a stove and then when you would iron and you would stop, you would set it on a metal device so it wouldn't burn whatever it was sitting on. And the device that you put the iron on was called a flat iron. Mm -hmm. And these are shaped like what a lot of the flat irons were shaped like back in the day. Some landmarks achieve national recognition, like this guy. Thing two, iconic natural landmarks may have local, regional, or national recognition. And this one would certainly be national, it's Pikes Peak. Is there any doubt that people recognize that? That for some people is almost like, um, flat irons to boulder. It's for some people Pikes Peak and Colorado are almost synonyms. So do you know what we called it before we called it Pikes Peak? The big one. The big one. <laughs> <laughs> nice guess. <laughs> James Peak. Yeah. Pike came along in the autumn of 1806 and actually got to this area at the end of October, early November and they could see this thing looming up there while he and his group were coming along the Arkansas River. And once they got to the, the confluence of Fountain Creek and the Arkansas, they decided to go climb it. And they were gone for three days and didn't even get halfway up because they didn't realize how far away it was, and they never did find the road. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So he wrote in his uh, book after the uh, expedition that this was high enough that no mortal man would ever climb it. And he thought it could be somewhere up around 18 to 20,000 feet. Well, <laughs> it was just uh, about six years later that the Stephen Long expedition came into Colorado and the physician naturalist on the expedition with Long was Edwin James and he got permission from Long to try climbing this and he and two other guys went up one day, camped down below uh, tree line, got up above, got up on top and then collected specimens and when they were coming back down they found out they left their fire going and they'd started a forest fire. <laughs> and so some of the stuff that they had left in the area was already burnt and damaged but James was the first one to actually go to the top and then write about it and make it generally known. So it was called James Peak until the gold boom of the 1850s and people started referring to it as Pikes Peak again and that became the official name at that time. Yeah? Where is this picture taken from? Uh, it is taken from somewhere near Pikes Peak. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Judy, where were you? Yeah. I think it's on the west side because you can see the uh, switchback on the top up there on the highway as you're coming around. And that switchback is on the west facing slope. So this would be over in the Woodland Park area or Florissant area looking back to the east at it. 
about Mount Evans. This is from on top looking down. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those days where you just kind of go, ooh, wow, how nifty is that? Do you have any idea how this got the name Mount Evans? Evans was our last territorial and first state governor of Colorado. So he was the guy who saw the transition from state, uh, territorial status to statehood status. And it's the, one of the uh, tall mountains you see when you're in the Plains or Denver area and you look to the south, there's Pikes Peak, you look to the west and there's Mount Evans, and then you look to the north and you get another tall mountain. Mount Elbert is out there in the Sawatch Range and the big deal about it is it's the highest uh, point of land in Colorado, but thing three is, though Elbert Summit is our highest point of land, the exact elevation is not standardized. So you can get four or five different resource materials and they will give you four or five different elevations for this mountain. And there is no government entity or organization that standardizes them. So whatever somebody chooses to accept as being the, the best thing. One of the problems with this is there are people who go up there with these GPS things that can determine elevation and they stand up on a rock and it's on their wrist or they're holding it like this and they're already five or six feet above ground which makes it five or six feet higher than what the actual elevation of the summit is. And so there's got to be a standardized way of doing it instead of a random way and that's never, never come about as yet. So then we have the Front Range, and that's, that's uh, a landmark that is really, I mean, people talk about it all the time, do we not? Mm -hmm. That's what we see when we look out to the west from here. But what do you really know about the Front Range? Well, there's that little high point over there on the left, and that would be Long's Peak, named after Stephen Long of the Long Expedition. Has anybody ever read about that expedition? You know what that was about? No? Do you care? Yeah. Do you want tidbits? Yes. Whereas the Pike Expedition and the Lewis and Clark Expeditions were established by and ordered by the President of the United States, this expedition was ordered by the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun. And the objective was they wanted to expand various military posts out in this place called the District of Louisiana. And they needed to know what was out here in order to understand how to provision it. And so Long's charge was to find the headwaters of the South Platte River and to document the resources along the way so they would know what kind of water and food were available for the horses in the cavalry. Does that make sense? So each person in a cavalry unit had three horses. So if you had a hundred person outpost, you needed 300 horses and then a few extras. And in order to have that many horses, they had to have stuff to eat and they had to have access to water. And so Long's charge was document what's out there so we know how much is available so we know how to build these these military outposts. About 1812 then? Uh, they left in 1819. They got into Colorado in the summer of 1820 and were here for about three months. And it was his physician, James, that made it to the top of Pikes Peak. Thing four. References to along the Front Range have developed a cultural misperception of the Front Range being an urban corridor rather than a mountain system. And so especially for people that are just moving to Colorado, haven't been here for very long, they don't think of the Front Range as being the name of a mountain system. They think of it as being this place kind of Colorado Springs to Fort Collins or Denver to Fort Collins and it's that urban area and what have you and people talk about along the front range, in the front range, and what have you. And as a consequence, it's taking on a cultural perception and not just a geographical or geological perception. 
Then there's red rocks. Does that look like anything you're familiar with? Almost looks like a broken cookie, doesn't it, or something? But this is an aerial view of the Red Rocks Amphitheater. It's both an amphitheater and a Denver mountain park. And it's part of the structure known as the Fountain Formation, which is sedimentary in nature. And it's become kind of a world famous venue for musicians and performers to be at, at Red Rocks. Uh, but there's also a park there with a couple of walking trails. And if you go farther south of Denver, there's another park with a lot of, um, uh, of this formation at Roxboro State Park. And then on down outside of Colorado Springs is Garden of the Gods. And it's the same sort of thing. And there you can see Pikes Peak in the background. It's a park owned and managed by the city of Colorado Springs. And thing five is that, you remember who uh, General William Palmer was? The guy who founded the Denver Rio Grande Railroad and founded the city of Colorado Springs and what have you? Well, he, yeah, Palmer Divide. He bought land on the fringes of what today is, is Garden of the Gods and built a rather spectacular place down there. It's a castle that he had dismantled in England and brought over here and rebuilt. When you have money, you can do that sort of thing. Well, he had a friend in the railroading business, and he convinced the friend to come buy land in this area because it was so aesthetically pleasing and such a garden-like area. So the friend came out and, and laid claim or bought something over 400 acres here. And his ambition was to always build a house there, but he kept putting it off and putting it off. And the day came, he finally passed away. And while he owned it, he let the public come and wander around and hike through it just because it was such a beautiful place. So when he passed away, his children said, Dad didn't want this to be developed, so they gave the little over 400 acres to the city of Colorado Springs to develop as a municipal park. And that's how it came about. Then there are Pawnee Buttes. How many of you have been there? Wow, I'm impressed. I asked a group that <coughs> oh, a week or so ago, and in a room of 30 people, not one had been to Pawnee Buttes. And only two or three of them knew where the Buttes were. So, have you read the book Centennial? Yes. By Michener. James Michener. Remember Rattlesnake Buttes? Yes. Th those were the motivation for the Rattlesnake Buttes in Michener's book. That takes us back a few years, doesn't it? Yeah. He, he published that in what, 68, 69, something like that? Maybe even a little earlier than that. So, do you have any idea what a butte is? Yeah, one of those. <laughs> I just keep setting you people up. I can't believe I'm doing this. So, let's try this. Thing six is a butte is a vertical projection of the ground and it's got more bulk or substance to it than a spire, but it's not as expansive as a mesa. So if it were tall and skinny, we'd refer to it as a spire. And if it really stretches out, we'd call it a mesa. But if it's more like that, then we call it a butte. Okay? okay. Did and you I'm, just make that up? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm perceiving a small element of antagonism here today. <laughs> we call them Pawnee Buttes, but there is no documentation that the Pawnee people ever came into or inhabited eastern Colorado. And so why it was Pawnee Butte instead of, of Apache Butte or Comanche Butte or whatever, I, I have no good answer for that. Great Plains. This is a term that is also broadly misused. Um, we often end up by hearing people use the term prairie and plain interchangeably. You ever notice that? Pay attention especially to weather forecasters and in one sentence it's there'll be high winds out on the plains tonight and when the plains pass the sun will be out on the prairie tomorrow. 
and that sort of thing. And the next thing you know is people are using the term plains and prairie as if they're interchangeable. Kind of like, have I ever told you about altitude and elevation? <laughs> Have I told you about that yet today? No. no so so there's, there's a difference here, and it, it matters that we get our language right. So thing seven is, plain is a term for in, from geomorphology that indicates that when, when you have a horizontal expanse, whether you go 100 feet or you go 1,000 feet or a mile or whatever else, the elevation relief in that horizontal expanse is is either negligible or minimal. And at some point, there's enough slope there that we refer to as hills, and when it gets to be big enough, we refer to them as mountains. But way back in February, I was telling you, there's no definition of what is and isn't a mountain. It's just one of those things, we recognize it when we see it, but that doesn't mean we've defined what it is. So plains are these expanses that are they're not flat like a tabletop, but they don't have much elevation relief. Okay? So the Great Plains got its name because it's such an expansive plain area in the central part of the continent. You go farther east and you get into the Appalachian Mountains and the other mountains associated with them. You go west, you get into the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas and what have you. And so in between are these plains areas. So when we use the word plain, we're referring to the shape of the ground, its physical structure. Is that from Arapaho National Wildlife Refuge, that last one? That one? Nope, that's from Pawnee National Grassland. Oh, right. Yep. So then we have these places called parks. You're probably familiar with those. There, I, I tried counting them one time by going through the geographic records, and I by quick counting at 200 parks in Colorado. And you know, the famous ones are South Park and Middle Park and North Park and that sort of thing. This one has some special appeal to my memory system here. I think I've told you about this before, but maybe not. I'm sure you'll let me know if I have. <laughs> so. Way back in 1974 when I first moved to Colorado, I, I found this thing on the bulletin board in the college biology building and it was El Dorado Eco Voyages. And I could go to San Diego and get on a boat and go down the coast of Baja and see gray whales and killer whales and elephant seals and, and all the stuff that a kid from Iowa had never seen before. And I thought, how cool is this? Well, I couldn't afford to go that year, so I started saving my money in ways you don't even want to know about. <laughs> you know how to do laundry as a cheapskate college student wanting to spend money elsewhere? You go up to the men's gym on Sunday morning, and you put on a t-shirt and you soap it up. And then you take it off, rinse it off, wring it out, and one of the engines, the prop engines on one of the Frontier Airlines went out, and so they didn't have emergency equipment in Gunnison, so they had to take us back and land us at Stapleton. And they had to try and figure out when they could get us all back to Gunnison, and some people rented cars and blah, blah, blah. They, they got us a, a Greyhound bus. And they put a bunch of us on this Greyhound bus, and we got out of there, out of Stapleton, by about 9, 9.15 at night. And suddenly we're coming over Kenosha Pass and going down into the little community of Fair Play, or Jefferson actually, Jefferson. So it's about, I don't know, 10.30. We get there, quarter of 11. And we stop at this little gas station place to get some snacks and use restrooms and stretch legs and what have you. And after a break, we get back on the bus and we're headed down the highway and we're about five miles south. And this lady on the bus sort of shouts out, Ah, oh, I forgot my purse! Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. So we stop the bus and the bus driver goes to turn the bus around in the middle of US 24 in South Park at about 11.15, 11.30 at night. Did I mention it had snowed? Oh, no. He backed up too far and the back end of the bus got stuck in the snow in the ditch and he couldn't get us out. So here we are sitting on the bus and nothing's happening. 
see if you can imagine me doing this. I stood up and I took charge. Could you imagine that happening? <laughs> and so I said, all right, if we're going to get out of here tonight, we're going to have to push this bus out of the ditch. So everybody off the bus and I will help get it organized and when, when I count, We'll push and then we'll let go and then we'll push and we'll let go and we'll get it rocked out, we'll get out. Except for you, you have a broken leg, you stay on the bus. And so everybody got off of the bus, men, women, children, everybody. We got behind that Greyhound bus and got it rocking and by golly, we got it out of the ditch. Oh my God. Yeah, something, yeah. Got back just as the lady was closing up the gas station. So our, our passenger got off, went through the store, went through the restroom, looked in the trash cans, looked all over, couldn't find her purse anywhere. So we had to leave without it. But at least we got home to Gunnison at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> because of the ice going over Monarch Pass and a, and a Greyhound bus had to go really slow. So I have, I have memories of that little Jefferson community. Yeah. <laughs> Then there's North Park. Is anybody familiar with North Park? Yes. Yeah. Is anybody familiar with an old uh, settlement western movie by the name of Shane? Yes. Yeah. Anybody see the movie with Alan Ladd and Jack Palance and what have you? Yeah. Shane! Shane! I love you, Shane! Okay, maybe not. At any rate. <laughs> Shane, come back. Yeah, Shane, come back, yeah. The, um, the guy who wrote that was uh, from Southern California and spent time living in the Santa Fe area. He wrote several books and he was up traveling through Colorado and he was in North Park and in traveling through North Park he got the inspiration for the book. And so he wrote the book Shane based on his experiences up there in North Park. I bet there are people in North Park who don't even know that. So. Anybody recognize those mountains back there? That's the park range. Yep. Thing eight. Park is a term from plant ecology and biogeography that applies to an enclosed treeless expanse. So park is a botanical or, or vegetation term and plain is a geomorphological term, so you cannot use park and plain and that sort of thing interchangeably. It doesn't work. So you can have a place like this that's kind of a flat plain up in the mountains and it can be covered with trees or it can be covered with shrubs or it can be covered with something else, but if it's treeless, then it's referred to as a park. Okay. How many of you knew that? So Estes Park, what is that? Yeah, when Estes Park was settled, all those trees you see up there today, about 90% of those have grown since the settlement days. So there were trees up on the mountain slopes outside the basin area itself, but down in the basin, it was pretty much grass, shrubs, wildflowers. And then people settle and they plant trees because they want shade around the house and wind breaks and the next thing you know is you have a lot of people, buildings, and trees. So, can you think of any other parks? Estes Park, North Park? Middle Park. Middle Park? Allen's Park. Allen's Park. Mm -hmm. There are parks all over everywhere. There's a California Park and all kinds of things. So then there's the San Luis Valley and it makes you wonder why, why don't we call them all valleys or call them all parks or something? Why are some of them North Park, Middle Park, South Park, and then all of a sudden it's San Luis Valley? Why isn't San Luis Park? And it's just the caprice of language and of people who are putting the names on the maps. And there's no standards or guidelines to that. And so it's kind of a, a free-for-all sort of thing. But the San Luis Valley is certainly famous because it's the first area of, of what would eventually become Colorado that was permanently settled by European ancestors, the Spanish. San Luis in the San Luis Valley is the oldest European-based or American-based settlement in the state of Colorado. So, that's Blanca Peak in the background. So, thing nine, 
Valley is a term from geomorphology that applies to a low-lying area within a single mountain range. So you can have valleys between mountains and a mountain range, or it can be a low-lying area that separates mountain ranges. So when you're down in the San Luis Valley, you have the Sangre de Cristo Mountains on the east, you have the Cochitopa Hills on the north-northwest, and then you have the San Juan Mountains over on the west side. And it's like when you go up to North Park, you have the Medicine Bow Range on the northeast, and then you have the Park Range on the northwest and west, S Rabbit Ears Range on the south, and then you have the Never Summer Range on the southeast. So you have these separate mountain range <laughs> systems with a low area in between them, and that low area is a valley. So a valley can be grown with trees and be forested, or it can be open and grassy and be referred to as a park. Is all this coming together? So what's a prairie? Tall grass? Or short grass. Or short grass, because you got your tall grass prairie, your short grass prairie. It's a grassland. Where does step come in? One question at a time. <laughs> So a prairie is a vegetation type where the plant life is dominated by grasses. And so plain is a character of the physical attributes of the ground. A prairie is a vegetation term of the kind of plant life that covers that ground. So you cannot use the term plain and prairie interchangeably. So the way plant ecologists are defining it today, and this is not a Kevinism, I would admit it if it were, but it's not. Prairies, the grasses grow at least one meter tall or taller, that's 40 inches. And in some places where we talk about tall grass prairies, here in the United States, it wasn't unusual for those tall grasses to get up to 12 to 15 feet high. There are places in Asia where the tall grasses can reach 20 to 30 feet. So that's a lot of tall grass. And then the grasses grow so close together in a prairie, you have almost no bare soil, and shrubs are absent from prairies. They may be on fringes or around a water area or something, but they're not a standard part of the vegetation. Now you come to a step, and in the steps, the vegetation is less than a meter tall, less than 40 inches. There's bare soil, often grown over with lichens, but not always, and shrubs are an obvious component of the vegetation type. And so they are different from a botanical perspective, and our animal life knows those differences, and we have things that will live in a steppe that won't live in a prairie, and we have things that will live in a prairie that won't live in a steppe. And I figure if a lizard or a wasp knows the difference, we ought to be able to know the difference. <laughs> So do we need to go over that, that, that rodent thing about dogs and squirrels and steps and prairies one more time? Or is this uh, pretty clear in your mind right here? So, great sand dunes are certainly a natural landmark of Colorado. We talked about these uh, a little while back when we talked about the national parks in Colorado. These are the highest or deepest inland sand dunes of anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And they may not be as expansive as in the Sahara Desert or Saudi Arabia or what have you, but in terms of the total height from solid ground to the top of the dune itself, we have the highest ones of anywhere in the world. Kind of a, an amazing thing. Those are the Cochitopa Hills that you see over here. And then the San Juans would be over there, and behind me would be the San Great of Christos. Right? Everybody been there? Mm -hmm. Just one of those places you're kind of glad that you've been there, but it's not like you need to go twice a year the rest of your life. Yeah. So what we have is a prevailing westerly wind. So the winds start from way over there and come all the way across the valley. And the Sangre de Cristos are a ridge or a range of mountains with a ridge that routinely hits 14,000 feet. But at this one place, 
it, it weeps down or sags down and it's only about 9,000 feet. So as the wind is coming across the San Luis Valley and it pushes against the, the uh, Sangre de Criso Mountains, it's funneled to that low area and as it's funneled together over that low area it loses its velocity and the grit that the wind has picked up gets dropped in front of that low area. And a river. Yeah, and there's a little stream that trickles through there from time to time. So are they growing? Are they getting taller? They get bigger and then they get smaller and then they get bigger and they're constantly shifting shapes. But the highest one is at or a little over 800 feet from the, the valley floor. Yeah, that's, that's quite a walk to get up there. Then there's the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. A lot of people just refer to it as the Black Canyon, but its <coughs> official geographic name is Black Canyon of the Gunnison. And I was talking about this when we talked about rivers in Colorado uh, last year, last March. Do you remember March? <laughs> Do you know the difference between a river and a creek? No difference. Good. This guy saved you folks. Yeah. <laughs> the Gunnison River did not erode the canyon. The canyon formed as a result of a geologic event, an, a tectonic event, and when the land split open, it captured the river and incarcerated it, and there was no place else for the river to go. And so it was a a geologic event that cracked the earth that created the place that trapped the Gunnison River. Okay? And in there is a structure called the Cure Candy Needle. Has anybody ever been down through the, this area? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Stories. Some of them more painful than others. So I started working as a seasonal interpretive naturalist there in 1976. And arrangements had been made and budget had been allotted to get a, a tour boat in the eastern end of the Black Canyon. And so that started up in 1977. And... Um, it's kind of amazing because they built three dams in the, the eastern half of the Black Canyon. And Blue Mesa Dam backs up Blue Mesa Reservoir and then downstream nine miles is, uh, or 11 miles is Morrow Point Dam and then nine miles from that is Crystal Dam. <coughs> and so the idea was that people could drive down below Blue Mesa Dam Park and walk out and get on board this tour boat and then one of the Park Service interpretive naturalists would take them all the way to the far end of the reservoir and back. Right? So it just so happens I was that naturalist the very first year that all this got started so I helped work out the details of timing and interpretive materials and reference materials and all that sort of stuff and then about 15 years later they decided for the federal government to let go of that and they now contracted out to concessionaires who do that. Well, it was year two of this, so it had been about 1978 and our tour group was going by Cure Candy Needle and there was a guy in a canoe that waved us down um, after we were coming back from the trip and so I went out on the the main deck of the boat and, and asked him what was going on and he said I was climbing the needle with my partner and he fell and I can't find him and so I got on the radio and called back to the main office and said we have a need for a search and rescue operation there is a missing person that may need help and so I exchanged a little bit with uh, the people in the office and I decided the right and proper thing to do was to stay with the friend in his canoe and help him look 
and keep the radio so I could contact with the park people, but send the rest of the people back on the main boat. So that's what, what happened. But the big deal was, that hurt so bad in this, is that there was a clogged up fish cleaning station in the park and the maintenance people would not keep the radio clear so I could communicate with the search and rescue people. So I'd be trying to get through to tell them where we were and where we'd looked and all that sort of thing and find out how long they were going to be and I couldn't get through to talk to them in a meaningful way because they were trying to get this fish cleaning station unclogged. And so I filed a report of complaint to the superintendent of the park and to the district office in Denver and I was completely ignored as, as if nothing had ever happened. It took the search and rescue crew an hour and a half to get there. And then when they got there, they talked for a half an hour to decide what they were going to do and they never did find the guy's body. Danny Petrie was his name and he was from Pennsylvania and it was one of those things that just tore my heart out because there was nothing else I could do to help and I, I couldn't console his friend there was nothing I could say to the family that came out or any of that sort of thing and I felt like if people had paid attention better and prioritized this we might have at least been able to recover a body but it never happened so he's down there in the water somewhere all these years later Not every story in my life is chucklesome. Then there's this guy just around the corner from uh, the uh, dams. <coughs> Dylan Mesa is on the north side of Blue Mesa Reservoir. And it's made up of, of volcanic ash that mixed with rain and became a muddy sludge that kind of oozed really slowly over time. And then it hardens off and it's so soft that it erodes easily and creates this kind of textured pattern. Well, <coughs> I'm working for the Park Service. Did I mention that? <laughs> yeah. And they hire a landscape architect to design some hiking trails and some picnic areas and what have you. And the next thing you know is these, these plans are put out there and I'm looking at them and the guy has gone from calling these the Saponero Needles to the Dillon Pinnacles. And I said, wh wh where'd you get that? And he said, well, Saponero Needles just doesn't have any, any oomph to it. It doesn't have any flair. And so I, I named them the Dillon Pinnacles. And I said, you can't do that. <laughs> that other name is already established and it's already on the maps and the atlases. That's what everybody knows it as. And I was told uh, if I expected to have my job back next year, I'd keep my mouth shut and just go along with it. You get the idea why I didn't end up making a career out of being a naturalist with the National Park Service? So you go over to this day and you look at this on the Park Service maps and they will call this the, the uh, Dillon Pinnacles. But you look in an atlas and they will refer to it as the Saponero Needles. And just around the bend from that is this one, the Soap Cliffs. Anybody hear of a, some old cowboy actor named Wayne? <laughs> John Wayne and he won an Academy Award for a cowboy figure playing a sheriff actually not a cowboy true grit they filmed part of that right below these cliffs and I've watched that movie at least twice and um, well twice last month uh, <laughs> I keep trying to see this in the background and I, I keep thinking I got a glimpse of it but then it's gone and so I'm never quite sure that they actually captured this in the film footage itself but part of the movie was filmed in that area and it's such a bright and outstanding sort of place that just kind of leaps out at you when you're in the Blue Mesa Reservoir area and then there's Grand Mesa that's that shadow in the background that you see back there and uh, 
I photographed that one from inside Colorado National Monument. So you can be over here in National Monument looking east and see Grand Mesa, and then you can drive over there and get up on top and look back and see Colorado National Monument. It's all kind of a fun thing to do, in case you don't have anything to do this Saturday. <laughs> Autumn colors ought to be pretty nice. Yeah. Last Friday. Yeah. Thing 10. Grand Mesa is described as the largest flat top mountain in the world. I have no verification of this. I have written geographers, I have called geologists, I have checked with cartographers, and nobody can give me any kind of actual information-based, fact-based detail that corroborates this claim, but what the heck? You know, it's in Colorado. Claim to fame, people. Take it. <laughs> so. That is the Grand Mesa back there, and a mesa is much wider and expansive than it is tall. And that's why it's Grand Mesa and not Grand Butte, that sort of thing. And up there, in that little area up there, is a place called Land's End. And I'll tell you what, if you have never been there to see the sunrise behind you and illuminate the Uncompahgre Plateau and Colorado National Monument, or been there at sundown, to watch the, the sunset over that area. That is quite frankly my absolute number one most favorite aesthetic view in the entire state of Colorado. It is fabulous up there. So, Mesa Verde. There are a lot of people that are familiar with Mesa Verde from the standpoint of being a national park. Does that sound kind of familiar? Yep. Well. Thing uh, 11 is Mesa Verde is actually a geological structure. It's a mesa, and it's not just the national park that's on top of the mesa. And when you're in Cortez looking back east, you can see that, that large expanse that makes it a, a mesa. But most people think of Mesa Verde in terms of the archaeology and the, the national park, but they don't think of it in terms of its actual geological structure. Blue Mesa Reservoir qualifies as the largest body of water in the state of Colorado, but is it really a natural landmark because it only exists because people built the dam and then we manage the water level? And yet wildlife is accustoming itself to it and its own ecology is getting up and going and so it's kind of blurring that, that boundary of definitions between being man-made and being natural as a landmark. But when you look at the total volume of water and the length and the perimeter and everything else, this is head and shoulders beyond the second largest in the state of Colorado. But it turns out Grand Lake is the largest natural body of water in the state of Colorado. And thing 12 is, in terms of depth and total water volume, Grand Lake qualifies as our largest naturally occurring lake in the state. How's that? There are a couple of natural lakes that are, are longer or they have more perimeter to them, shoreline, but they're not as deep, so the total volume isn't as great, and that's where Grand Lake comes in first. So. That brings us to a few rivers, but we've already talked about rivers for a month, so I'm just going to mention one in passing, the Colorado River. When you think of Colorado and rivers, doesn't Colorado River just kind of leap right out there at you? Yeah. I mean, there's so much to it. I mean, all the energy production and the diversion for irrigation and all the things that go on with the Colorado River, it is so embedded not only in our landscapes and our lifescapes, but in our culture scapes as well. That Colorado River is right up there with Pikes Peak as being sort of synonymous with the state of Colorado. This is where it gets started in the Kawanichi Valley of Rocky Mountain National Park. And then this is what it begins to look like as it flows downstream. And by the time it leaves Colorado and flows into Utah, it's a fairly substantial body of water. So, those are our 12 things about uh, naturally occurring landmarks in the state of Colorado. And you remember all 12 because you were taking notes, right? Mental. Or mental, yeah. So, would you like a little review? Yes. You betcha. 
So, an iconic natural landmark is a structure that exists through the forces of nature and is definitively identified with a very specific place. Iconic natural landmarks may have local, regional, or national recognition. And though Mount Elbert Summit is the highest point of land in Colorado, its exact elevation is not standardized. References to along the front range have developed a cultural misperception of context about the front range in that people think of it as being an urban development area or corridor as opposed to being an actual name of a mountain system within the state. The land that became Garden of the Gods Park was originally acquired for building a private house that was never built. A butte is a vertical projection of land about as wide as high, making it more robust than a spire, but not as expansive as a mesa. Plain is a term from geomorphology that indicates negligible to little elevation relief in a defined horizontal expanse. Park is a term from plant ecology and biogeography that applies to an enclosed treeless expanse. So we wouldn't refer to the Great Plains as a park because it's not really enclosed in the manner that we think of. But when you get to North Park, you've got four mountain ranges with tree lands all around it, and so North Park is enclosed, and it's an obvious visual plant ecosystem. Valley is a term from geomorphology that applies to low-lying areas within a single mountain range or between seemingly separating mountain ranges. Grand Mesa is described as the largest flat top mountain in the world. Mesa Verde is a natural mesa and not just the name of a national park on that mesa. And in terms of depth and total water volume, Grand Lake qualifies as the largest lake in Colorado. <coughs> Questions? I actually pulled this off in an hour. How about that? Yeah. Uh, plateau yes. versus Mesa versus Butte versus... Yeah. Is there a definition for plateau? Sure there is, I guess. I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the way they distinguish plateaus and mesas is how they're formed, is what I'm told. And plateaus are the result of uplifting in the Earth's crust, and then they get separated off, whereas <clears throat> mesas, buttes, and spires are the result of erosion. Is there a difference between a needle and a pinnacle? Uh, only in the mind of a landscape architect. The question is, was there a difference between a needle and a pinnacle? And to my knowledge, that's just one of those cultural whims that we choose to call some things pinnacles and other things spires and other things needles, and there's no standard geographical criteria by which we determine what to call one or the other. Yeah? So in terms of the Rocky Mountains, that's an enormously <coughs> long range, and you identify several other ranges. Are they all considered part of the Rocky Mountains, or are they somehow separate mountains? It all depends on who you talk to. Oh. <laughs> Another one of those. So when you have a, a massive mountain system that is the result of kind of an ongoing and sustained geologic event, then it, it creates these expansive, very, very large continent scale mountain systems. Those are referred to as cordilleras. And a lot of people pronounce it Cordillera, thinking it's, it's from Mexico and Spanish and what have you. But it was originally spelled with one L back in, in Spain, and when it was pronounced with, or spelled with one L, the L was pronounced. When it came into American English usage, we added the second L. And so it's Cordillera, not Cordillera. What can I tell you? So when you have big systems like we're a part of here in Colorado, we refer to it as the Rocky Mountain Cordillera, but there were individual events, volcanic events, uplift events, and what have you, erosion events, that created separate mountain ranges within that Cordillera. And so the way geomorphologists talk about it today, there's Northern Rocky Mountains, Middle Rocky Mountains, and Southern Rocky Mountains. And so Colorado's mountains like the Park Range, Medicine Bow Range, 
uh, Front Range and a few others constitute the southernmost limit of what's called the Southern Rocky Mountains. And then when you cross a line, you get into this magic area where you're into the Rampart Range and Pikes Peak, and that's a different thing that's outside the Rocky Mountain Range system, and then the San Juans are outside that, and the Sangre de Cristos. So they're not referred to as Southern Rocky Mountains, but they're part of the Rocky Mountain Cordillera. See how complicated this stuff gets? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Capitol Reef National Monument? Mm hmm. Is it a reef and what is a reef? Or does it have nothing to do with the I know where it is and I can find it on a map, but I've never read a thing about it. Oh. So maybe it's called reef because it structurally resembles a reef in its, its geology. Maybe it used to be underwater and there are fossils there. I don't know. Anybody else know? No. Oh, anybody else? No? What? The Colorado, Hang on. Colorado River is given credit for creating the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. How do they know that since it's not created Grand Canyons anyplace else? Was it a rift? Yes. It, the river got trapped in a crevice that was a result of a geologic event, but it's been there long enough over enough time that it's eroded things the way it has. So when you look at the Black Canyon, the walls of the Black Canyon are like this, and then when you look at the walls of the Grand Canyon, they may be like that for a little ways, but they spread out like this, which means the river has been wandering around in that rift for a long time. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of when did that happen to incarcerate that river to allow all of that to happen. Yeah? Is it that a park can be used as pasturing? That gives it this word park. That, that brings in human usage and an agricultural perspective and for a certain part of our society, that makes perfect sense and it's part of language tradition. But in terms of biogeography and how things are defined in a plant ecology sort of way, uh, grazing doesn't come into the picture. Yeah. Yeah, are any of our mountains, uh, like Mount Everest and everything, they say that that mountain range, they're actually getting taller. Mm -hmm. The pressure's pushing, pushing them up. Do we have any mountains? Uh, here that are actually moving slowly? Yeah, our mountain ranges are still growing and some years they actually gain a centimeter, about a half an inch. And other years it's a tiny fraction of that. And so over time that, that can add up, but uh, it's not like they're growing a foot a year or 10 feet a year or anything like that. So it can take a long time. And then there's erosion that takes place because of wind and ice and freezing and thawing and all that. So it gets pushed up a half an inch and it gets eroded down a quarter of an inch. It gets pushed up an inch, gets eroded down an inch and a half. And so it's not like they're, they're growing fast enough that you can take a picture of it 10 years apart and see the difference. Okay. Yeah, our, our, our Cordillera, the Rocky Mountain Cordillera, it's not static, it's not dead in the water. But there aren't any huge events that have happened in our lifetime that have made uh, really major differences, but could happen. You ever done any reading or studying on Yellowstone? When they, they, they say that that's really uh, slowly building pressure. And, yeah, um, that's one of those places where by our best information and our best assessment standards, when we get through doing a mathematical analysis and come up with a risk picture, Yellowstone National Park could go berserk any given day. It's that, it's yeah. that far along. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've read. So it could happen yesterday, it might not happen for another hundred years, it could happen day after tomorrow. Yep. So it's one of those places, it's a good idea, don't, don't build there. <laughs> Yes, yeah. 
So what's happening in a place like Yellowstone is there's a fracture in the structure of the Earth's crust down deep. And you have these things called plates that are sections of, of the Earth's crust, kind of like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. And instead of being in fixed position, they move. And because they move, they bump into each other. And as they bump into each other, there's stress from that collision. One ends up going over the top of the other. One ends up by going down underneath. And that creates a zone of, of friction that's unsteady. And that's where things happen. And Yellowstone is in one of those fractures. And it's so intense, there's no way for it uh, to dry up, heal over, cool down, and what have you. It will always be a hot spot forever. <coughs> well, thank you for coming today. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>